On today's Locked on Thunder podcast, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder grinding out a win over the Minnesota Timberwolves. And do the Thunder have a new rival in the NBA? We'll talk about it all on today's show. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast or the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host if over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles, follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder grinding out a win in Minnesota, the potential of a new rivalry, the vibes around this Thunder team, what makes them so dangerous. We're talking Chet Holmgren as well. A lot to get to today brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Helps find you the qualified candidates that you need to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedinjobs.com slash locked in NBA. Terms and conditions do apply. So the Thunder in this game play Minnesota on the road. They are in the fourth game of their road trip, which started out 0-2, dropping two games in LA to begin the trip. And you remember the vibe after those two LA games we were about to head into Utah to play a red hot jazz team. They were nine and one in their last 10 games. They were fantastic at home, still are fantastic at home. And it looked like this was a stretch where it could spiral a bit for a team in Oklahoma City who's never lost more than two games in a row. They were already in a two game losing streak and was going to play a tough Utah team. And Minnesota on the road, who has had the, the, the Thunder's number a little bit recently, and then of course just played them really tough. And it's tough to play Minnesota this year uh, in Minnesota. So it went from a trip where you're thinking, hey, things could spiral out of control and, and, and by out of control, you know, a four game losing streak before you come home, play Portland and stop the bleeding. But that was, you know, kind of a different feeling that we've typically gotten this season from the Thunder. Well, again, it's very rare to get to the midway point in the season and have not had a longer losing streak than two. That shows you the caliber of team that the Thunder are. And not only did they get a game on this trip after dropping the first two, but they salvage out a two and two road trip. I really believe that if you if you polled Thunder fans after you know the, the the last home game against Orlando, and you and you showed them the four game road trip, many of them would sign on the dotted line for a four and four trip, because that's a very very tough task. You know they they were in the midst of uh, five games and seven nights. They had the back to back. They had a lot of travel involved. And yet they went two and two after starting 0 and two. And and this was a very tough game in the sense of Lou Dort will return for Oklahoma City. Uh, Minnesota was fully healthy. Both teams only were without G League League assignments. Like this was the top team in the West versus second best team in the West record wise. It was a matchup that you really circled and wanted to see. And it became a slugfest. Oklahoma City won 102 to 97. And throughout this time, you know, for the Thunder's early season and their red hot start, the, all the talk has been about, can they do it on the road? Can they do it in multiple ways? And each checkpoint, the Thunder have passed that. Because when the Thunder have been shooting lights out and they've been shooting 50 plus percent from the floor in these games, they've been the best three point shooting team in the NBA for the vast majority of the season. Of course, you're going to win those contests. But when things bog down, what happens? You can't get much more bogged down than the Thunder shooting 39% from the floor, 33% from three, and only scoring 102 points in the modern NBA and limiting your matchup to under 100 points. Minnesota shot 41, 37, 72. The Thunder won points in the paint by four. They dominate second chance points uh, by 14. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they were dominated in second chance points by 14, but the Thunder won fast break points by 11. The, the key difference here is. The Thunder forced 21 turnovers. They only turned the ball over eight times, and they just hung around. This was a game of runs as NBA games typically are, but the Thunder handled the adjustment to zone. They made uh, they made the personnel change necessary to uh, capitalize on Minnesota's zone, not bogged down as bad as they did uh, the first meeting between these two teams. But they survived eight lead changes. 
They survived seven ties and they survived blowing a, you know, 19 point lead, 19 point lead on the road again. And they not only blew that big lead that, that they garnered in the first quarter, but then they got down 12 themselves. So think about that swing of a 16 point lead all the way down to just zero evaporating. And then you dig yourself to a hole uh, down 12 and still you're able to win on the road versus the best record in the Western conference. But the reason why the Thunder are so good and the reason why the Thunder are so lethal is that they can beat you in a shootout because they can they can at times shoot the ball so efficiently and so well and they can score so many points. But when their offense stalls, it's not over. When their offense stalls, you don't just pack it up and go home. You have to beat the Thunder for 48 minutes. They've In this season alone, they've survived games like this where they just cannot score at times. They've survived a 30-0 run and won that game. They've survived blown leads. They've survived comebacks. They've done it all to win basketball games this year. But the constant thread has been that the Thunder are never out of it, even in games that they've lost. Like, look at Atlanta on the road down the stretch, that run that they had to have a shot to, to go ahead at the buzzer, to push the game into overtime at the buzzer. Like, those runs happen in like, like less than two minutes to go in the game. This Thunder team has been special at sticking together and finding a way to win, finding creative avenues in which to have success. And Minnesota was no different. Because the Thunder can hang their hat in a lot of different areas. They have an MVP level score. They have complimentary scores. They have off-ball scores. They have cutters. They have everything that you could want on this team for the most part, except for rebounders. And, and they could use more physicality. But on the other token of things, if those shots aren't falling, if the offense isn't humming, they can just step in and have a top defense in the NBA. I mean, this is one of the best defenses in the NBA. And they can buy you time with that defense. What happened in this game was that the Thunder got the stops necessary and, and waited around enough until the offense just simply clicked for a moment. This was going to be a test of who was going to budge first, who would blink first, because both teams have a really good defense. Who could snap out of it? Mike Conley played one of the worst games he's ever played. Rudy Gobert was awful offensively. Carlton Towns was not special offensively whatsoever. And again, by his standards, Anthony Edwards was not good offensively. So this was, was a, a testament to the Thunder just hanging around. The emotional roller coaster of on the road to blow that big lead and get down 12. You get down 12, but the offensive performance that, that you had to that point, you, you might have been thinking to yourself, yeah, this game is over. We just don't have it tonight. Let's just go ahead and pack it in. That wasn't the case at all. Like that was, that was, could not be further from the truth with this Thunder team. So I, I think that the, the caliber of games the Thunder can play in and win show you how successful this team can be in the future show you how successful this team can be this season. Because playoff series are going to be a lot like this. There's going to be matchups where from game one to game seven, you might play six different kind of games. You might play a couple offensive games, a couple defensive showdowns, a, a game where nothing's clicking because it's an afternoon game and you're throwing the ball away and, you know, and you know, turning it over left and right. There's going to be a lot of different kind of you know, situations that you're going to be put into. And so far in the regular season, each situation the Thunder found themselves in, they've found ways to win. They've done it on the road. They've done it versus good teams. They've done it versus bad teams. They've done it at home. They've done it coming back from uh, big leads, blowing big leads themselves, uh, building big leads. They've, they've done it all. They've done it defensively, offensively. And I just, every game that passes by, I just fall back to, they could use rebounding. They could use some more physicality. And they could use experience. But one of those three things they, they literally cannot go get. You cannot go add games to the basketball reference data point, and you cannot change your birth certificate. So they, they can't do the, the inexperience thing. It's just going to happen. And I don't believe that you know, trading for some NBA veteran is going to all of a sudden change this team in less than 41 games. Like, you could go trade for, for the, the most winning player ever. If you believe that these guys are not going to be able to stand up to the lights in the postseason, they're just going to have to go through that war. So like it's it's not going to be fixed at the at the trade deadline. But you can go fix rebounding and physicality a little bit at the deadline. You can go make moves on those margins to get better there. But you're still going to be leaning on SGA, J-Dub, and Chet and, and, and these young players. And to this point, they've been up for the test. They've been up for the task. 
there's exceptions to every rule. There's outliers to, to every, you know, philosophy. Why aren't the thunder another outlier? Why aren't the thunder an exception to that rule? Because I have a hard time buying that come playoff time, this team who has tested their medal and won against the, 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 the Nuggets, the Timberwolves, the Celtics, you know, with all these great teams that have outlasted these teams, both home and road, that have made adjustments to these teams already, right? Think about how much harder it is to make an adjustment whenever you're playing, say, Minnesota at the end of December. You've played 10 games between then and now, and you're trying to adjust to them again. Versus you have a couple of days off in between each game and you're playing the same opponent, you know, back to back. That's why the baseball style series are so interesting in the regular season, because you kind of get to simulate that a little bit. The Thunder, each time they've played an opponent, whether it's dealing with their zone or dealing with their star players, they've gotten better at handling them game to game. They've put those adjustments to memory game to game in the course of an NBA season where you're not practicing as much. You're, you're just focused on recovery. You're, you're not really getting to fully scout the other team. You're, you're trying to work. You're trying to work internally when that thing flips to the postseason and you're working fully on one matchup for you know, a couple weeks straight. You have to be overexcited with how good the thunder can be in that scenario. How good this coaching staff can be in that scenario. So I, this idea that, you know, come April 15th, they're going to forget how to play basketball because they're, they're young. I can't really buy that. And it's games like this. that are the reason why. It's games like this that make me believe that this Thunder team can be the exception to the rule. I also believe that this Thunder team could bring back rivalries in the NBA, and we'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, my good friends over at LinkedIn, check out linkedin.com slash NBA. Folks, go check them out today because right now it's the start of the new year, and every small business and every small business owner even is asking themselves the same question. And it's the one thing of how can I move this business forward? How can I take it to the next level in 2024? LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success depends on the team that you surround yourself with. And that's why LinkedIn has created the tools to help you get the right professionals for your team and get them faster and get them for free. LinkedIn has the job offers and the job board that you want to make sure that you can find those professionals, find those people who can help you quicker and faster because they understand, hey, small businesses, so much is is weighing on you as the owner. You're wearing so many different hats. You're, you're having to use all your resources and time uh, to, to invest in this, in this entity. And you want to shave off some of that time, but still make the proper hire. And that's what LinkedIn is here to help you do. So LinkedIn uh, is there to help you uh, get to the qualified candidates faster. Uh, you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked MBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder Basketball. It's Monday. I cannot wait to record this afternoon our fake trade episode that's coming out uh, Monday night, Tuesday morning. So, Get in your questions for your, your fake trade, your ideas, or even if you don't want to go craft a full fake trade, you can just simply uh, throw a name that you want to see the Thunder go get. And I'll talk about that player just in general. Uh, so I, I don't want to give you too much homework assignment. So if you want to just comment a name and say, hey, what about Dorian Penny Smith? We'll, we'll talk about that as well on the show. It's going to be so much fun. Cannot wait for that. I appreciate all of you who did, the, did take the time to go make a full <laughs> trade machine uh, trade. Uh, for, for the show. It's going to be a lot of fun to go over. Also, check out the Lockdown Sports Today YouTube channel. It's a 24-hour streaming channel of like all the national and local news that you could ever want. Uh, it's the only one of its kind on YouTube for free. So go check it out today at Lockdown Sports Today. Now, let's continue talking about this Thunder Wolves game. I think that one of the most interesting aspects of this game happened off the court. The Thunder have an ability to get under team skins. It's the way that they play. It's the way that they keep on coming at you time and time again, it's going to be 48 minutes uh, of just brutal basketball to endure because most of the time in the NBA, night in and night out, you grow a double digit lead, 15 point lead. You might see their team just kind of quit, kind of go through the motions a little bit. That's going to be frustrating for other teams to, to handle in a regular season setting. Plus the Thunder are just really good. And they have really good players who can all make just back breaking deflating plays. Then they're going to let you hear about it. 
Then they're going to go on Twitter and have fun, on Instagram, have fun. And you're going to see them enjoy themselves after a game. We saw this sort of with the Thunder and, and Warriors whenever Andre Iguodala said on his podcast, uh, Point Forward, that you know, the, the Warriors took note of Shea's Instagram post and, and they woke up the beast. It's not gone that way yet for, for Golden State. We'll see if they turn it around. Didn't really wake anyone up uh, on the team for, for Golden State. The two matched up again. It was a lot of fun. You can kind of tell that the Warriors wanted to try to win that game after the Instagram thing. We'll, we'll never know if Iguodala was for sure telling the truth that it bothered them, but uh, you know that, that adds a level of chippiness. Then you have the, the Wolves. After the game, Anthony Edwards was asked the same question that, that pretty much everyone has been asked. Every player who plays Oklahoma City, because they're this surprise team, because they're this young team playing this well, they've been asked their thoughts on the Thunder's core, their thoughts on the Thunder, just in general as a team. And to this point, every player is just given the same kind of coach speak answer. Those are great players. Everyone's trying to figure them out right now. Yada, yada, yada. But Anthony Edwards, of course, frustrated. You know, this was a close game, divisional game, two top teams in the West. And he missed three clutch free throws. That would have changed the game. So obviously he's frustrated. And he took that time to go and dive into SGA gets a tough whistle. And, uh, you know, it's tough to defend them because you can't touch Shea. And he's a great player. And so whenever he gets that whistle, it's hard to beat them. SGA shot 13 free throws. Anthony Edwards shot 10. Missed the three to, to tie the game. But nonetheless. And SGA, with his patented post-win Instagram post, captioned it. They talk about my post game, not my post game. Of course, referring to they talk about his play on the court and not what he says uh, at, at post game media availability. There's no hiding that that was a shot at Anthony Edwards. Of course, Anthony Edwards was less veiled talking about a Shihei. But this could be a fantastic thing for the NBA because the one sport, the one thing that this sport lacks, it's my favorite sport in the world. If you're listening to this podcast every single day and subscribing and liking, I really appreciate you. That means it's obviously one of, if not your favorite sports as well, especially if you listen year round, which is even more impressive. The one thing that it truly lacks, even as the biggest NBA sicko who watches the G League and covers the draft and, and, and every game, it does lack that emotional kind of just emotional feelings around other teams. Like, like being a Chiefs fan, you watch that game against Buffalo. I've never been to Buffalo. I know like one Bills fan and while he is annoying, it's not because of the Bills. I still just don't like that Bills team. I, 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 I see that logo. I see that team. I just, I hate it. I, I want the Chiefs to win that game more so than, than the other games that they play. Whenever they play the, the Jets, right? And having that, that kind of rivalry of just two fan bases with a healthy hate for each other, I think can really improve the sport. It was so fun whenever Trey Young stirred up the New York crowd in, in that playoff series. You see those kind of flashes, but something more sustained. And this could be the rivalry to sustain it. No, these two fan bases just do not like each other. Friend of the show, Clemente Almanza, stirred up a ton of T Wolves fans after the game. But you can tell that there's just, there's just a disdain for one another. They're in the same divisions. So you're guaranteed to see each other four times a year. That in and of itself can breed rivalry. Even last year, you had the, the scrappiness between Kenny Hustle and Rudy Gobert, uh, you know, and those two kind of got chippy and got tossed. But there's been this kind of underlying bubbling between these two fan bases. You saw it back at FIBA. Anthony Edwards versus Shea was the biggest debate over the summer. Shea has clearly out elevated himself over the conversation of Anthony Edwards. But, but still, if you're a Minnesota fan, you want to fight for your guy. You want to, you want to make the case for Anthony Edwards. There's no case to be made, but you still want to try to make it. You're both in the Western Conference. You're both you're trying to have this similar pathway in ascension up the Western Conference. And so as the two superstars go back and forth for, for each fan base, that's like your, your general, right? Barking out the orders. This could be something where you're guaranteed to play each other four times. You have two young teams who are social media savvy and just media savvy in general. And two fan, two fan bases and two teams that are not going to forget any of this stuff that happens. You don't think Anthony Edwards will remember this on January 29th in Oklahoma City 
if he has a great game, which he's bound to to, to play great, I mean, he's a, he's a star player. He can play great any game against any player, against any team, even though it's going to be tough against Lou Dort. If he has a great game and they win the game on the 29th, you don't think he's going to talk to the media and have some sort of jab? He's fantastic at press conferences. It's one of his best attributes is how funny he is uh, and kind of how he can make a snippet. It makes content a lot easier. You don't think after that 29th game, he's, he's going to have some reference to that Instagram post? On the, on the same token, you don't think SGA will have another line about the Wolves? Lou Dort got in on it too. Uh, you know, he, he posted on Instagram, they've been afraid of the big bad wolf. These two teams, again, Thunder, very frustrating to play against because it's a pick your poison type of team. Timberwolves have a, have a passionate Anthony Edwards on the court and off of it. They have Rudy Gobert, who is not afraid to get chippy. You know Rudy Gobert all too well in Oklahoma City. This could be the next NBA rivalry. And so as Shea hits the step back dagger three and Anthony Edwards misses three clutch free throws, that might have just birthed something that this sport has been missing. Something that this sport really needs is that two teams who play four times a year are going to have those four games matter. Like right now, the Thunder lead the season series to split it could end up being huge for Minnesota with tiebreakers and how close the Western Conference standings are. Two teams that project to be good for quite a while. It could be really, really fun. It, it could be something that becomes a NBA wide phenomenon that you're going to want to tap into and follow. So I, I think that, you know, whenever you look at this, the spectacle that was around these two players, around these two teams over the weekend was a lot of fun to follow and could elevate this sport even more. We'll talk about all that coming up, but first we're also going to talk about Chet Holmgren uh, and his game. I thought he played a fantastic game. We're going to talk about Josh Kitty, Isaiah Joe, Jay Whale, a lot of players that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and finish recapping this this Wolves game. But let me know what you think. Do you have that disdain for Minnesota? Do you think that these two teams uh, can be rivals? And do you think that the NBA needs rivalries? We'll talk about all that coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, my good friends over at BetterHelp, check out betterhelp.com slash NBA. When you do, you're going to get $10 off your first month. And what BetterHelp is, is it is uh, you know, a therapy that can really help you. So if you've been thinking about you know, trying out therapy, but you fall back on the same crutch of excuses of, you know, don't have enough time in my busy schedule. Got to worry about you know, work, school, family, uh, you know, responsibilities, you know, having, having everything going on in life. I don't have time to like carve out, you know, a, a time a day or a week uh, or a month to go to a actual building and see an actual therapist, uh, you know, in person. What you can do is go see a therapist online. And what the benefits of better help is that it is fully crafted around your schedule. It is fully flexible. Not only is it just online, but they'll still work with you. And you, and you, you can need any hours or or whatever kind of time frame works for you, weekends, weekdays, weeknights, whatever works for you, they're going to craft it around your schedule. And it's a really cool process. You fill out this questionnaire, then they're going to match you with a licensed therapist who is going to help you out. And and you know, if if you if you match with that therapist and you guys click right away, you feel comfortable, you feel confident to empower yourself with therapy. Perfect. If it's not the right fit for you, guess what? You can just you can just redo it and and get a new therapist, and you can do that as many times as you need at no extra charge until you find the therapist that will help empower your journey. So check it out today at BetterHelp. Go there right now to get started uh, and 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 celebrate the progress you've already made. Plus, build on that at BetterHelp.com/slash locked in MBA. That's BetterHelp.com/slash locked in MBA for ten percent off of your next month of your first month. Check it out today at betterhelp.com slash locked in MBA, 10% off of your first month at BetterHelp. I want to see you right now, but good friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel's great. And right now it's a lot of fun to check out FanDuel because first of all, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That is $150 in bonus bets, win or lose, when you place that $5 bet. And so when you go to FanDuel right now, you can check out Championship Sunday. I mean, what a time. In the NFL, you have the NFC Championship, you have the AFC Championship. The Chiefs are in it. Patrick Mahomes has never fallen short of the AFC Championship game. You can go bet on that at FanDuel. What a day Sunday could be. The Thunder Pistons game got moved up to 1 p.m. You roll from that into the Chiefs game, into the Lions game. That's a that's a full day and a full day that you can spend on FanDuel. They have the NBA, they have the uh, NFL, they have college basketball, they have all the sports you could ever want. Uh, and then also, 
just throughout the week. I mean, I mean the, the Thunder take on uh, the, the Trailblazers on Tuesday. You can check that out as well. Tonight in the association, you have the Magic plus one at home versus Cleveland. I'm all over that plus one for Orlando. I know it's a back-to-back, but still, I'm all over that plus one for Orlando right now at FanDuel. Check it out today at FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Chet Holmgren played really well, and he continues to adjust to the physicality of Minnesota. He did not let Rudy, Rudy Gobert get as deep into the paint as he did in their first meeting. That was a that was a continuation on an improvement he made uh, in their second meeting. This third one, he played really well. Uh, he showed his great defensive ability all game long. He truly is able to guard at times two players at once. You know, Ch- you know, uh, Mike Conley was driving through the lane on Chet. Chet's on his hip. Conley dumps it off to Rudy Gobert. Chet flips his own hips, gets over to Rudy Gobert, and blocks the dunk all in one motion, wiping away a Conley drive and a Gobert dunk attempt all in one play. He, d- he defends the pick and roll solo, especially whenever you let him play drop. When you have him playing drop coverage, he's able to shade over towards Anthony Edwards' drive. Anthony Edwards, of course, sees the, the attention, dumps it off to Rudy. Once again, Chet recovers, blocks a Rudy Gobert cutting dunk, which is insanely hard to do. And this has been something that's been happening all throughout the start of his rookie season. You can go check out Michael Martin's YouTube video today uh, on Monday afternoon. I believe it comes out at 11. I'll retweet it, though, so you can not make sure you don't miss it. Uh, on Chet's blocks, he, he details every block. It's really cool. Uh, it, it just kind of shows how impressive Chet's been defensively. This game was no different. Uh, going to the rack, very hard, got to six free throw attempts in this one, five rebounds, two assists, uh, a steal as well. One for two from three. Cashed in that drive and kick, three from Shea, really lethal. The fake spin, fadeaway jumper was cool over Rudy in the, in the mid-range. And I think you have to think about how much respect. This is like a this is like a play that I think encapsulates what we talked about this center team in the preseason all the way through now. The respect each player has on the floor. This is all in one play. Where Chet gets the ball, top of the key, Fakes a pass to the slot where J Dub's at. It sends Anthony Edwards flying to try to go contest J Dub's three because J Dub's shooting otherworldly right now from three point land. And so that, that takes Ant out of the play. Rudy Gobert, of course, closing out hard on Chet, who can really shoot it himself, gives a shot fake. Rudy Gobert goes up in the air. He's now out of the play. Chet dribbles in and hits this floater at the elbow in no man's land because nobody's there anymore. No one has been able to step up from the baseline. Of course, you have Ant flying the other way. You have Rudy Gobert flying, flying behind the play. He creates this opportunity, this open shot for a seven-footer to do this little push floater at the elbow with just two fakes, not even moving. And like, it's just because of the respect you have to have. You have to have the respect for his ability to pass it to J-Dub. You have to have the respect for him to just shoot it himself, and he can make you pay for it. I thought that he's positioning himself way better offensively as the season has gone on. It showed a lot uh, in the dunker spot today where where he's on the opposite side of the paint. He's demanding the ball, and then he doesn't get it. So he he rotates to the opposite dunker spot as, as Joe is cutting. And then as he rotates, Mike Conley realizes, hey, Chet's all alone in the paint. Someone's got to do something. So he goes and tags Chet. Obviously, Conley can't do much. However, Chet's not lazy. He continues to work. He knows he could have just kind of demanded the ball steal with Conley, but instead he takes his hip, his hip, puts it in front of Conley, seals off Conley, to where all Joe has to do on this drive is just throw the ball outward, uh, you know, forward in front of Chet. Chet gets that, throws up a layup. It's an easy bucket because Chet just positions himself better. I mean, it, he could have scored over Conley anyway, but that positioning makes things so much easier on everybody, the passer, and of course makes it easier on on, uh, on Chet. So really good uh, job from Chet. Uh, him and Jaywell and, and Kinrich did a really good job um, in this entire game, taking on Rudy and Cat. Those two guys were were really just rebounders. Now, to their credit, they were fantastic rebounders. I mean, you can you can go and look at the rebounding numbers yourself, right? They were they were fantastic rebounders, but they, they, neither one of them did much offensively. Rudy Gobert was really bad offensively, frankly, and it was largely due to those three guys. Let's talk Josh Giddy. I think that Josh Giddy just has a loud game, right? And so because he was so bad at the start of the season, and like let's face it, he was bad at the start of the season. His mistakes just kind of look loud in these scenarios. Not every player is supposed to be a superstar. Not every player is supposed to be able to play against every matchup. Most players have bad matchups. And this was one for Josh Giddy. Josh Giddy goes two for eight from the floor, 0 for four from three, 
but he had eight rebounds, seven of which defensively, those were huge. Four assists, uh, he had a, a wild, just wild fling behind the back, down the floor. I don't know how he made the pass. I don't know how he, he did it to, to connect to Shea. Shea went to dub, and J-Dub scored, uh, which isn't like a like hockey assist for, for Josh, but, but to get the Thunder down the floor that quickly on a loose ball was insane. He had a steal, just one turnover, five points. He was a plus one. He did not play badly. Like, yes, you can... You can freeze frame plays where no one's paying attention to Josh Giddy and it hurts the Thunder spacing. And yes, missing the four threes horrendously hurts because there were open threes. There were good shot attempts. He just missed them. And that's going to happen. Like Josh Giddy's going to miss threes. Every player's going to miss threes. Isaiah Joe, even, who is one of the best shooters in the NBA, had an 0 for 5 night this week. Like these things are going to happen. But it just feels louder when it's a tight game. Uh, and when you're playing a team that, that that is one of the best in the NBA and you're trying to claw back and, and you're missing threes and each, each possession feels like it could doom you, it feels worse off than it was. He didn't doom the Thunder in 24 minutes. He did not play bad. This is just a bad matchup for him. The Thunder were actually able to put him on a bigger body than this one. He got a steal, uh, and his one steal was like whenever he was absorbing contact from a cat drive, uh, and it just showed that like cat just couldn't go out there and bully him. I wonder if like this is something you look at long-term if you're Oklahoma City and, and you saw the the transition Jada made uh, in his body from, from age you know 21 to 22. Let's see if, you know, the Thunder want to do that to, to Josh Kitty or Josh Kitty wants to do it, however that works. Let's see if Josh Kitty can do something like that and really start to, to play down low as a team defender uh, down low when you can kind of put him on these matchups. But anyway, just maybe something you want to explore long-term. Uh, he, he was working off ball in motion, which was really good for him. He had a, he had a mid range jumper at the nail, which is something that we've preached a lot about is that the difference for Josh Giddy will be scoring inside the arc, but then he misses a, 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 a dunker spot push shot, which he just has to make. And, and we've seen him working on that shot with ship England more in practice. This is a brand new role for him. Uh, you know, he's not used to being a dunker spot guy. So like, it, it's not surprising that, that, that he misses a shot like this sometimes, but just in general, in his, in his role, that's going to be something that he has to do. But what I think is just like so overblown is that like, this is just a bad matchup. And the Thunder didn't commit to the bad matchup. They played Isaiah Joe off the bench two less minutes than, than Josh Giddy. And it's no harm, no foul, so to say. But the bad matchup is like, Josh Giddy cannot drive into space against Rudy Gobert. Not many people can. Rudy Gobert is one of the best rim protectors in the NBA. It's what we talked about against Boston. Like, Josh Giddy can't drive into KP. Porzingis is one of the best run protectors that we have, like in the NBA. Like, so like some matchups, there's just nothing you can do. I don't think that Josh Giddy did anything wrong in this game. Like did anything just abhorrent. He, he missed four open threes. Yep, you you would much prefer to make the threes than miss them. But there's nothing like just awful Josh Giddy did. It's just you, you can't play him against certain matchups and you had a better option. And the better option was Isaiah Joe, who, who even though he only went, you know, one for three from the floor, one for two from three, the threat of him shooting pulls over defenses. And when you're playing a zone and you have a player like Isaiah Joe, who when you swing him the ball, you're going to have at least one, if not two players rotating over to him because he commands that respect. And you have a player in Isaiah Joe who with that respect can, can quickly make a decision and swing it to the open man and beat the zone. You're going to use that to your advantage. You saw him get an assist on the drive. You saw him get an assist uh, you know, on the perimeter. Like he, he can do everything you need to beat a zone. Plus, I think he's a he's a better defender. I think he's a better team defender and a better uh, point of attack defender. And he has the ability to scrap for rebounds. Obviously, you take a drop off in the rebound category from from Josh Giddy, but Isaiah Joe has been a good rebounder in his own right for his frame, for his size, for his position, for his time on the floor this season. So Isaiah Joe is just a better option. And, and there's always going to be games like this where someone else is a better option for for every player not named Shea. Shea's the only player where you want to give him as many of the 48 minutes that he can handle no matter who you're playing, no matter how he's playing, no matter independent of like anything else, you want to give him as many players as you, you know, as many minutes as you want. Chet, of course, in that category, j in that category of like players who, not to say that you're stuck with in a negative way, but like players who you're just stuck with giving them a lion's share of the minutes because they're so good and because they, they demand it. There's certain limiting matchups right now for Josh Giddy, and Portland's not one of them. He will have a really good game against Portland. He had a triple double last time they played Portland doesn't have that rim deterrent. So he's able to go to the rim better. And when he goes to the rim, it opens the floor for the rest of his game. And you saw that the last time that they played, I would expect much of the same 
uh, this time that they play. But again, Jay Will deserves a lot of credit coming off the bench. Uh, he had two blocks, one where he he flies out to contest uh, an Akeel Alexander-Walker shot, but stays down on the floor, then gets onto uh, a Nas hip, and then swats a layup. And then another one where he just timed up uh, McLaughlin, put back with ease, and just kind of followed it the whole way, tracked it the whole way. And then he's able to thrive in the pick-and-pop DHO area. Uh, and if he can consistently knock down that baseline jumper or like turn into a dunker spot threat on top of that, then you can start to see him be more playable on the offensive end. But we'll see what he's able to do long-term, but this is just a good game for him. And, and on the flip side of that Trash Kitty thing, Jay Will has much more of a niche matchup where he's going to be very successful in. So this was one of them, like where you you want to see Jay Will play. You want to see Jay Will play at times with Chet Holmgren in these matchups. And they've done that before as well. So this was a good matchup for, for Jay Will. Lou Dort back you know, from, from having the, the illness and what elite defense he had on Anthony Edwards. Like, like that is the best you can defend Anthony Edwards. Now look, Edwards is one of the best players in the NBA. So he still shot 60% from, from the floor. He still scored 19 points, but it was tough, tough to score those points. And, and Lou Dort stayed with him. Heck of a job to, to switch screens, uh, fight through screens, I should say, and stay with Anthony Edwards. Uh, who played really well. Lou Dort played well in his own right offensively, 43% from three, five rebounds, 14 points, an assist, two steals uh, from him. It was a great game from him. And the Thunder uh, were able to just get stops. And eventually, they were able to get scores. And that's how the Thunder won this game. And it was a large part getting stops with Lou Dort. The MVP of this game is Chet Holmgren. Next up, again, I cannot wait to do your fake trades. Recording those on uh, Monday and putting it on Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, Portland recap, Thursday, Spurs recap, Friday, mailbag podcast. Plus, we're going to talk more trades because the, the, let me just leave a little secret here. Uh, not, not a real secret, but the, the rumor mill, it's going to uptick this week. So, so by Friday, we'll have a lot to discuss on the trade front. Plus, your mailbag, your mailbag questions, I'm sure, will have a ton of trade conversation. Saturday, we're going to recap that Pelicans game. So, a full week, you're locked on Thunder. Subscribe anywhere you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. Leave a like. Leave a review, leave a subscription. It's free. It's all free. Follow me on Twitter and threads uh, at Ryland underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one.